Hi, welcome once again to wilsonlyling.com Leadership Podcast. In our podcast, we seek to bless the body of Christ through different aspects of teaching in leadership, intercession, the prophetic. Today, I want to share about breaking your glass ceiling. What is a glass ceiling? Well, it often refers to that invisible limits that occurs in organizations that that limits the advancement of certain groups of people. But my focus today is really not on the external factors, but on the internal factors. Invisible, but very real, internal factors that that limits us from developing further as leaders. Limitations that exist in our minds and in our hearts Limitations that are more imagined limitations than real limitations. So what is the difference? What is the difference between the real limitations and the imagined limitations? Well, real limitations are those sort of things which are humanly impossible for us personally. For example, I cannot fly unaided. I cannot lift 100 kilos. It's just not possible physically for me. An imagined limitation is a limitation imposed by our own thinking. In other words, it is humanly within our grasp, but we have not reached it because of our mental frame of mind. For example, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, Moses actually proved to be quite eloquent later on. He did not need his brother Aaron's help. In the first half of the 20th century, many people thought that it was humanly impossible for a man to run a mile in less than four minutes. For many Champion runners, they tried, and, but they simply could not achieve this breakthrough. Some thought that perhaps the human heart would just burst under that strain. It was physiologically impossible for a man to run a mile in less than four minutes. Yet, in 6th of May 1954, Roger Bannister, a British, he did break that four-minute mile. And when he broke the barrier, it it broke not only the physiological barrier, but it broke the psychological barrier. Once he did it, the world realized that man can break the four-minute mile. And in fact, within a few weeks, the barrier was broken once again by another runner. And then from then on, one runner after another will continually begin to break it. And in fact, today, it is common. It's common to see the champion athletes break that four-minute mile. Truncated thinking limits us. It limits us from becoming who we can be. Are you a truncated leader? Because of the way you are thinking. It is time. It is time to break past your glass ceiling. So let us look at the few key glass ceiling areas that leaders we should confront. The first area is the issue of faith, what I call the faith glass ceiling. Faith, as you might realize, is the substance of vision and dreams and moving into the future. Faith is needed of a great leader. Because you must have faith to believe in what God can do and begin to see what is going to begin to happen. In October 1971, Disney World in Florida had a grand opening. A journalist commented to one of the directors there. He said, what a pity that Walt Disney is not alive to see this. For you see, Walt Disney, he died in 1966. But the director had this response. He said, oh, but he did see it. That is why we have it today. You see, Walt Disney had faith in what they could achieve. It was a faith in his vision, a faith in the organization that he had founded. 
a faith glass ceiling means there are areas. There are areas which we have limited ourselves from believing for. It is a faith limitation rather than a divine limitation. It is a limitation due to the lack of our faith in God who can do all things. When the 12 spies, the 12 Israelite spies, when they went out to scout the promised land, they brought back a poor report. The Bible records for us in Numbers chapter 13, verse 27 to 28. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land of, uh, to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here, it's its fruits. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. And they, it went on in verse 32 to 33. It says, And they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explore devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, that is the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. And we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes as we look the same to them. Wow. So, in the natural, perhaps it would have been not possible for the Israelites to defeat the people of Canaan. But with God's help, it could have been done. The limitation was in their trust in God. Consequently, they could not be used by God. It was, in essence, a sin of unbelief. They could not see what God already saw. So, how do we increase our faith in God? Well, how do we have more faith that God can provide all that is necessary? Well, we have to deal firstly with our inner blockages. What are some of these? The first thing I would say is ignorance. It could be ignorance of what we're actually capable of or ignorance to what God has called us to. You see, it's hard to have faith about something that you are ignorant about. Do you know that there's a large majority of Christians today that do not operate at all in any of the supernatural gifts, even though that is actually meant to be our heritage? Because they are ignorant. They're ignorant about the nature of these spiritual gifts. They are ignorant about how it operates. They're ignorant about how the Holy Spirit leads us in it. It's like not knowing what, what our arms are for and, and not using it at all. What can we do about ignorance? Well, we got to find out what is available for us through God's Word. Read good Christian books that deal with those areas of faith that perhaps we're ignorant or lacking in. Talk to mature Christians that seems to be more knowledgeable about those areas in which we are ignorant about. Another area is doubt. It is one thing to know God and to know His Word. But it is another to trust Him, trust His promises, trust what He has uh, recorded in His Word. There can be doubt in God's faithfulness, in His provision, or, or the power and authority that God has available to work in us and through us. Many years ago, I made a decision. I determined that I do not want to be an unbelieving believer. So, how do we deal with such doubts that may be in our hearts? Well, firstly, we must decide that we're going to believe in everything that the Bible speaks about, especially the promises that's meant to be ours. Of course, can I say we, we need to properly interpret the Scriptures to understand what promises are for us now and what promises are yet to come. And secondly, we, we need to specifically repeat Pent of our unbelief in any area of our lives. Turn to God, ask Him for faith, choose to trust God. Then begin to step out with Him in those areas. A third thing that, that limits us is fear. You know, there can be many fears that hold us back. Fear of failure, a fear of the cost that may be involved, a fear of success even. Some people are afraid success may change their lives. Whatever it might be, we need to recognize. We need to recognize that all fears of such nature is not from God. 
The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We are not to give in to fear. We are meant to overcome all these things. And so we must refuse to give in to such fear that holds us back. Instead, we should let God's promises infuse us, fill our hearts with faith. When I was a younger man, one of my fears is really stepping out into the unknown. Why? Because I dislike unpredictability. I, I don't like the unknown at all. I, I always like to know exactly what I'm getting into. I, I want to be able to carefully weigh up the pros and cons. Uh, for example, whenever I buy any equipment, I really want to make sure that they come with manuals so that I could read it. I, I, it gives me you know, great assurance that I'm not going to use this equipment in the wrong way. But as a leader, I, I had to come to terms with the fact that many times I will not get all the necessary information and yet I have to make a decision. I had to learn to make those decisions, even when there's insufficient information. I had to overcome some of my fears. In addition, I also had a fear of mucking up. I, I really like to do things when I know I can do things well. I didn't, I didn't like to fail. I didn't like to do something even poorly. So it really held me back from venturing into the unknown, from making mistakes, because I was so afraid of making mistakes. I had to break past that inner constraint that was holding me back as a leader. So let's just quickly look at how we can grow in our faith. I want to mention that there are two main areas we need to look into. The first is developing our convictions based upon God's Word. Many years ago, I actually started to challenge myself and said, Wilson, you have to develop deeper convictions based on every scripture that I read. Shallowness of my convictions is just not good enough anymore. Because of the responsibilities and where I believe God was leading me, I felt I cannot just you know, operate on a shallow convictions in my life. So I had to resolve that it's not adequate for me to just scheme over the, the, any scriptural promises or command that's in the Word of God, I, I, I determined that I must, I must develop sufficient depth in my convictions. So uh, I shared about some of this in my podcast on convictions, especially on building deeper convictions, which you can find as you search through our leadership podcast. The other area besides conviction is that we must take deliberate steps to uh, stretch ourselves to exercise faith. You know, convictions is like building deep foundations for a building, but faith is like constructing taller buildings built upon those foundations. So we have to choose to trust God in greater ways, choose to see what God sees by asking Him to open our eyes even more, even into the heavenly realms even. And so it, it can be in many, many different areas. We can be, have faith for generosity, faith for miracles, faith to exercise spiritual gifts. You see, for the example is Moses. Moses had to learn to step out in faith with God. It all started with God turning his staff into a snake. And then as God led the way, Moses had to start stepping out more and more with God. And as a result, as Moses did that, his faith began to grow. And he began to see bigger and bigger divine miracles. And God could ask him to step out to believe for it more and more as well. So I want to encourage you, you can start doing likewise. Start with the smaller areas. Put it into practice. Perhaps when you're going on a mission trip, when it, perhaps you're involved in some ministry, step out in faith. Begin to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, to show you. Maybe He might be asking you to pray for someone and believe for healing. Maybe He might be dropping a word, uh, a prophetic word in your heart. Speak it out. 
exercise it, step out in faith. And each time you may start the smaller steps, but begin to continue to stretch yourself, enlarge yourself, that you may grow in those areas. You could also do it with more experienced people in such areas. And when you're with them, soak in their faith. See how they step out in faith before God. So that's, that's the first whole major area of our faith glass ceiling. Let me talk about the second key area, which is the area of personal development. There is also potential glass ceiling that can exist in our thinking about how far we can develop. Have you ever felt like this and, and say to yourself, I just cannot do it. Uh, it's just not me. I, I tried but failed, so I can't anymore. We've hit a chasm that we cannot seem to cross. But is this the reality of what we cannot develop into? Or, or is it just what we perceive or assume we cannot actually develop? In reality, we can all develop in a lot more areas than we actually imagine. Perhaps some of us may feel like my leadership ability has, has hit the wall. Some of us may feel that our counseling ability has reached its limits. Or maybe our preaching ability, we, we can't go any further than this. Or perhaps our emotional capacity has is, is, is reached its limitations. Often, we feel like we've hit a wall because of one of these three key areas. The first one is the lack of knowledge and understanding. So we don't even know we can do better. Another one is due to a lack of appropriate skills. So we don't know how we could do something better. Thirdly, it could be a lack of capacity. So we, we feel that we are unable to do more of this thing. And so if we're going to develop further, we need to specifically develop in those three key aspects in whatever area that we're dealing with. So let's talk about knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding are an essential part of our self-development. And really the best way to gain more knowledge is by reading and study. You, you have to put in the hard work. We got to read strategically so that uh, it increases our depth and our breath in, in ways that enable us to grow our, our understanding of this whole area. You know, one of the things I, I get frustrated about is when people say they don't like to read and therefore they rarely read. When does like, when does enjoy have to become the limitation? How many of us brush our teeth every day? Do we say, oh, I love brushing my teeth. I love the sense of the brush of my teeth. I love the smell of the toothpaste. How many of us brush our teeth because we like it or we enjoy it? But we do it because it's essential. We, we brush our teeth because it's important if you still want to have uh, teeth in your old age. So there are many things we do that we don't really like all the time. But why do we do it? Because it's important, because it's essential. What is reading? Reading to learn is important. It's essential for our self-development. And perhaps as you read and you learn, you might begin to enjoy a bit more. So we must determine to learn, whether by reading, study, attending courses, conferences. There are many things that I've learned and applied in my life and ministry and that is, has been done through a lot of observation, uh, analysis, reading, and practice. We can increase our knowledge and understanding by diligently applying ourselves. The other area is the area of skills. You know, often we fail to carry out a task well because we lack the appropriate skills. For example, you may know in principle about the fact that you need to teach the Word of God. But when you lack experience, perhaps you might struggle more in leading a, a Bible discussion in a group. You may not know how to keep it interesting. Or, and as a result, that we may not feel like 
we are suited to leading Bible discussions. But perhaps what we need actually is more a bit more training so that we can increase the range of ways we can approach a Bible discussion. We, we can grow in our skills in dealing with the different group dynamics and, and dealing with individuals when they throw up curly questions and different things. These are skills we can actually learn. So with training, with on-the-job experience and with some coaching, we can really become decent in those areas very quickly. Now, how can we gain some of these necessary skills? Well, we should seek out some of the training avenues that might be available to us. Seek out some skilled people who can give us some extra guidance. Then you got to apply uh, yourselves diligently, intentionally. One of the things I love to watch is tennis. And, and one of my favorite tennis players is Roger Federer. How did Roger Federer, whom most people consider to be well past his prime, came back to the top of his game in 2017? I mean, he, he had held most gram, uh, the most slam titles since 2012, but, but since 2012, he had not won a single slam title. In 2017, he was already 35 years old, almost a dinosaur by tennis terms. And then in 2017, he won two slams titles that year. Why? What made the difference? Well, one of the key reasons is because when he had about a year away, he modified his skills. He increased the tools he had. He was able to improve upon his already excellent backhand, his famous backhand. He improved on it by making it more aggressive. He was able to hit the ball now with a greater top spin and uh, instead of just slicing and he was able to hit it harder and quicker that takes a lot of eye hand coordination timing and skills as well as confidence but he practiced and he practiced and practiced until he got it right that's why he was able, able to achieve far more you know when i first started preaching i did not know how to tell jokes I was poor at storytelling. So what did I do? I read jokes. I observed how people tell jokes. I watched some comedians at work. I began to learn about comic timing. I learned about the, how to create a punchline. I, I learned about the comedic twists, the delivery, the timing. It's the same with storytelling. I had to learn about being more descriptive, more vivid, more graphic. I, I learned how to f create the flow of the story, how to maintain interest and, and so forth. I was never a natural. I had to train. I had to gain the skills until it became natural to me. There's so many areas of my life and my ministry that I actually was not good at, but I was intentional. I applied myself to learn, to get the necessary training, practice until I became good at it. And so in many of those areas, I started out like so many of you. The third aspect is capacity. What is capacity? Capacity is about how much we can handle, whether it be emotionally, uh, mentally, physically, or spiritually. When our capacity is low in any one of those areas, we, you begin to feel overwhelmed. Your capacity to cope, your ability to cope sound, feels very strained. So, for example, if I am not fit physically, then in other words, I have a low capacity to, say, run. I, I would not be able to run several kilometers because I am physically just not there. I don't have the physical capacity. So how can we increase our capacity? Well, let me share a few thoughts here. Firstly, we need to change our uh, perspective. You see, it might surprise you, but the, if we change the way we view things, our attitudes can make a huge difference in our capacity. You see, sometimes we, we hold on to a negative, a defeatist attitude, which really begins to undermine your capacity. 
out of the starting block, we already have a deduction in our energies. Already we think we're not going to make it. Already we think we, we can't possibly reach it. When I've studied elite athletes, one of the biggest contributors to them winning against other athletes is their mental attitudes, their perspectives. And so if they had the right perspective, if they had the right attitudes, it can lift them to a whole new uh, level. And it can do the same for us. And often it has to do with contributing towards our persistence and our resilience. A real determination to break past those, some of those pain barriers. And sometimes it's about learning how to find joy and passion in what we need to do. It can make a huge difference. It's all about your perspective. It's very important. Another thing that helps our capacity is just begin to understand what are those things that helps build our capacity. You see, each one of us, we are unique. We have unique things that can help us build capacity and also in the ways that it draws down our capacity. For example, I'm, I am an introvert. So having a lot of deep, ongoing interactions with people draws down my emotional capacity. So when we're ministering to large groups of people day after day, it really drains me. Uh, and so to regain this emotional capacity, I need time. I need time by myself doing things that refresh me, like reading, thinking, basically alone time. That's, that's what I need. That's for myself. You could be different. So we have to discover how it works, how it works for us, and then begin to manage it so that we have time for capacity building. We, we fill up our uh, storage reservoir and begin to realize what are the things that reduce our capacity and cut down on those times if you can. We, you have to understand the rhythms of your life, in your work, in your ministry. Perhaps you can rearrange your schedule in some way so that you can insert some key times to build that capacity, to fill up the capacity so that you're not totally drained out. And lastly, we need the grace of God. At times, it's just simply the grace of God that lifts us beyond our limitations. It is like God just poured in more or He lift, took away the lead for us. Paul the Apostle felt this many times as, as an Apostle of Christ. And that's why he was able to say, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. It says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace upon me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So God can provide His grace, His strength, His empowerment. And we will discover that we will begin to be able to perform beyond our normal constraints and limitations. So we must learn to go to God and drink of His strength. Let me tell you the story of Gideon. Gideon felt that he had hit his glass ceiling in his own life. The Bible tells us the story in Judges chapter 6, verse 11 to 16. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abysrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But, sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us uh, out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon answered, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. You see, Gideon felt that he was too small too insignificant, too weak. 
But once God turned him around, he began to see himself as God saw him. He began to see a warrior. He began to see a warrior that's big enough. He began to see a warrior significant enough. He began to see a warrior that was adequate enough. He began to see a mighty warrior of God. Will you begin to see yourself as God sees you? Will you allow God to lead you in order that you may break past your glass ceilings? May God help you and bless you.